Good morning, everyone. It's just great to see so many people here today. We had an event up in Stormont yesterday in the Long Gallery with Professor Reid and uh, News Group for Mental Health. And again, that, that was just a fabulous day. Just feeds in more and more people. There's a hunger for having conversations. And this is really what a lot of this is about, is just opening up space for us all to have critical, respectful conversations around uh, mental health and what's working, what's not working, what the evidence is telling us and where we really should be going um, and, and working all of them out together. So it's, it's, it's lovely to be in this room with everybody this morning. As Lisa said, I work with uh, EPR, it's a human rights organisation set up back after the Good Friday Belfast Peace Agreement uh, in the early 2000s by Ines McCormick, who was a formidable um, leader, uh, trade union leader, um, peace activist, organiser, um, and Ines set up PPR really to look at the peace agreement and to look at the human rights and equality provisions which she and others fought so hard to get into that agreement to see were they going to make any difference to people's lives you know, all of the sort of things written down in, the, in, in black and white in the agreement, where they had they any teeth, and would they change things for people in their everyday lives, but particularly people who need human rights protections the most, so social economic rights protections like right to housing, right to health, um, and that's the starting point for the mental health campaign, which was started by families, families who've been bereaved by suicide, families struggling to get uh, timely and appropriate um, support for themselves and, and, and their loved ones. And like, like all good things, in the, in the years since, it has evolved and moved on a journey. And I think you had, you had journey up there, Lisa, but it's very much on, on a journey and constantly doing and learning from, from what we're doing. So just to give you a little sense of the campaign, um, it's quite important just to share with the PPR as an organization doesn't get any state funding. Because we're a human rights organization holding the state to account, it's very important for us as a principle that we, we, we don't, we're, we're, we are, our job as we see it is to hold the state to account. Um, so that's, that's why we don't, don't take government funding. Um, so in those early days, I said the focus was very much on suicide prevention, support for families who've been bereaved. Um, we did, oh, we've always worked with the UNL in the very top corner there, um, on the left, Bertie uh, and Julie on the right from the Shankill and the Shore Road, and Marissa from New Lodge, along with um, two of the committee members in the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee in, in, in the UN. Um, so we've always used human rights tools to shine a light. So it's a combination of sort of community organizing, using trade union uh, tools and tactics, along with human rights based um, accountability. Um, big campaign that the picture dropped down into the public health agency, the Health Institution Care Board as it was, around access to counselling and trying to improve access to counselling. Um, an open letter in the paper around suicide prevention. Um, so, but over the years with all of the campaigns, I think the learning for us was that um, families were coming together trying to fix bits of the system and increasingly realising this is huge. You know, we fix one bit, maybe around waiting times or getting a bit of extra funding in for counselling. We were talking about earlier, Brian, but you know, you did that and you took your eye off the ball and you went somewhere else and just, I think, over all those 15 years, something different, there's something of a different magnitude or measure, but coming from a different place as well. Yes, we were successful in, you know, getting advancements in those issues that people campaigned on. It was exhausting for people. People were burnt out. But because we were beginning to realize that this is a systemic problem, this, these are not individual bits of a system, that if we fix, everything will be, be fine. I think the learning from families who've been bereaved, who've really experienced dreadful loss and, 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 and pain and injustice in the system was that something different needs to happen here. So we, we got to sort of a COVID and I'll just flip on here a minute. Sorry. And, and this was the other learning for us, was just around the systemic thing, that this is underneath this, it's really around inequality. Um, and it's the structural thing again, it's around inequality, uh, uh, poverty driving that. So when you look at things like the data on anti, um, antidepressant prescribing or rates of suicide, all the evidence is these, it's not coincidence or chance that these things are at least three times higher in, in the poorest areas. Um, we know the rates for antidepressant prescribing here, one in five of the population, but in areas like Derry, the Shankill, the Falls, it's at least one in four. And when you go with older women, the data seems to say it's up as much as one in two people you know, that are on antidepressants. So we're, we're medicalizing distress. Um, and the same for the rates of suicide. The gap is widening. 
the, ga in, in, the deaths by suicide, the inequality gap in the poorest and, and richest areas, the gap is widening. So something is not working in the strategies that we have. Um, so we got to a point where with COVID hitting, just before we had the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, uh, Professor Daniel Spuris over up in the Spectrum Centre in the Shank Hill Road, and really we took so much out of you know what he was saying and he's, he's done so much work in this area and I would encourage people to look at the papers he's produced, we have them on our website. But he was saying that when you boil a lot of it down, we need to move the dial away from looking at chemical imbalance, which has now been just proven that it doesn't exist, a chemical imbalance in people's brains, and start thinking about power imbalance within society. Um, and we'll share these, we can share these slides as well with people, so if you want to for the quotes and that. So that gave us real pause for thought and then during COVID we had that time and we were thinking about the things that, that the United Nations and the World Health Organization were saying that this is about power, it's about the dominance of a particular model, a biomedical model, and it's about the asymmetries of power, you know, that, that there's a real, um, yeah, the, the power differential between people who need the, the, the services and people on the ground and communities and the people who have the power to decide what, 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 what is, being, is being provided. And also the biased use of knowledge and evidence. And I know that's something that Professor Reid has done a, a lot of, of work and commentary on. From all of that, we got to last February, with the 1st of February in Box in Bridges Day, and we launched uh, what's called New Script for Mental Health. The campaigners who've been there all along, coming through all of their knowledge and wisdom and really hard earned, kind of saying that this is something different that's needed. So this is the new script for mental health. And I guess what, what it is, is what I said at the start, it's an opening of a conversation, saying we know the existing system isn't working, and that's known the world over. You know, it's the frozen status quo, as the UN has called it. What can we do here? But rather than us as a campaign saying, X, Y, and Z is what's needed, and will you agree with us? We're saying, no, let's have conversations everywhere we can around, well, what isn't working and why isn't it working, but imagining something different and better, and that's essentially what New Script is. Um, and we do work in different ways. We organize ourselves. We still do the human rights work, which is holding government to account um, around failures, really serious, and with catastrophic um, implications for families and impacts on families, losing loved ones. So holding to account for failures in the system, uh, failures of oversight, particularly the RQIA and their failure to regulate mental health services for 14 years, and nothing much seems to have uh, moved on in that regard. Um, the, the lack of transparency, I guess, the, the huge lack of mental health data, it's an absolute uh, scandal here. We have hardly any mental health data in Northern Ireland compared with England and, and other places. And England, you know, people will tell you it's not good, but by comparison with here. So uh, we're doing a lot of work on accountability. We're building, the, the main thing we're doing, which is what today is part of it, building a movement, bringing people into conversation in different ways through these events, Curious Minds. We're partnered with a, an Irish language organization, Rhoda Mona, to put on this series of, of, of talks. Um, and then the other bit we do is called Collective Care. Um, and Lisa, you know, at the start, you can see that for us, um, we know we need to take care of ourselves and each other and all of us having these conversations and doing this work but in a collective way. So that's, we organize around all of that. There's an invitation to everybody here. You put your name on the mailing list, you'll find out more about the campaign, but we really would love to, uh, people get involved in different ways. Um, just run through these, there's some pictures. That's Professor Bill Sweet from Queens here, who's helping us with the accountability work. And um, Paul Herbert and his nephew Gareth, who've been in the news a lot, trying to get accountability for the lack of care for Gareth and get the RQIA to, to, to do their job. And there's just a few pictures of some of our uh, alternatives. We do a lot of um, music, drama, dance, creative writing, um, our poetry at Pocket Three Out on the Beach at Helens Bay. And that's some, some pictures of our collective care. The campaign won a national award just before Christmas uh, down in the Europa, so that was a real uh, tribute and recognition of the work that's happening. And Siobhan and Ke Kenny doing the, the nails of collective, collective care. And, some dance happening over here. Um, so that's that's just to give you a bit of a very quick run through an overview of the campaign. Our website, we do keep it updated and social media, so there's lots more information if you're interested to, to go, go and have a look. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
hand up. Yeah, so I'll invite Deirdre up then. As uh, Lisa said, Deirdre is one of the activists, and we're really delighted that and this beautiful um, picture here, and stand at the back as well. The activists, some, uh, quite a few people here were involved in a thing called Desperate Monologues, worked with Damien Gorman, who's a playwright, in January and put the first of February. We, we do everything at <laughs> super speed, uh, despite saying we're trauma informed. But <laughs> over a month or so, we did it. We put together a thing called Desperate Monologues and performed it in Youth Action's Rainbow Factory uh, on the first of February. And there did the, the, the poster designed by the group, and, and there did the beautiful poster with the, with the drawings. And Derda has written a poem which she's now going to, going to share with you. So. First, um, my name is Deirdre and I am an activist with PPR and um, take part in the new script for mental health. I am a survivor of domestic violence and I got involved with PPR to advocate for change, to share my real lived experiences in a bid to raise awareness and to help others. Recently I have found out that women are not even protected in courts, I'm one of them. Um, family court in particular, and they are used as basically a platform to further abuse, it's basically for perpetrators to further abuse their victims. Um, I've discovered that there are no mental health support systems in place at all in the courts to aid victims of domestic violence. I'm in court presently at the minute, facing my abuser each and every time I go there. Every type of abuse a man could possibly do to a woman, I'm reliving that every single time I'm in court, and I'm just expected to deal and recently, through no fault of my own, I have been forced to represent myself in court, no solicitor, no barrister, and I really couldn't do it if I did not have the help and support through um, the programmes that I've been involved in with the New Script for Mental Health. And basically, my um, introduction to New Script would be that it just provides a new way. It highlights that the investment in the creative arts can actually help the healing process. I have used dance, as you can see here, calligraphy, art, poetry as a medium to share my story. And really, it's using these mediums, which is a far cry from the doctors wanting to pill push and push medicines onto me. So that's basically a background to me. I wrote this poem because I wanted to try to make my negative experiences into something positive. And the only way I can think of doing that is to express this in poetry, but also that nothing can ever be in vain, and um, that's what the title is, Nothing is Ever in Vain. My world was falling apart, and I would dart around the place to find some healing grace. I'd go here and there, looking for help and get nowhere. I was desperate and in despair. I'd see black holes in life, and the deeper they got, the more I was in strife. There's no one to talk to, there's nowhere to go. The list and services are endless, it's all a bit of a mess. I'm in agony. I'm in pain. But my torture, my experiences, my trauma cannot be in vain. I try to get help. I try to reach out. It's closed doors what my life is all about. I want to talk about my problems, to express my fears, so that I can be there to catch other people's tears. And I hope that things will turn around so people do not be eternally bound to their past traumas and hurt and pain. I'm telling you now, nothing is ever in vain. There is a window. There is a way. I'm worthy and I'm not made of clay. You cannot mold me into something that you want me to be because I am unique and different and that's 